Uh, hello, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Patricia Heidegger. Um, I am the Global um, Policies and Sustainability Director at the European Environmental Bureau. And I'm very happy to welcome you to um, this morning's uh, debate in the name of the EB and Climate Action Network uh, Europe. Um, before we start, uh, just for information, we have interpretation in French. So if you would like to follow the discussion in French, just click to the on the little world icon interpretation at the bottom of uh, your Zoom screen and you can follow our debate in French. So um, today's event is part of a full week of public debate on Europe's fiscal future under the patronage of the European Parliament and the European Economic and Social Committee. So um, a reform of the EU fiscal framework could potentially boost investments in climate action, in nature protection, social and gender justice, well, the, the just transition and the urgently needed transformation to zero pollution and carbon neutrality that we, I assume, all want. So um, this initiative, um, the week of debate, aims at opening up um, a very broad debate on uh, European fiscal policy with a range of online events and workshops um, um, that are very accessible to all levels of, of knowledge. Um, we really believe that opening up um, a public debate across the member states is, is crucial to avoid that important decisions are being made behind closed doors. So if you haven't done so, so far, um, have a look at www wfiscalmatters.eu. You see there the full program, program and you will also see that uh, the events really range from high level conferences to, um, to uh, workshops, capacity building workshops um, on the basics of fiscal policy, um, on the myths around debt and deficit and the options um, for reform. Um, so today um, we are organizing a cross-party debate with uh, five members of the European Parliament from five different political groups. Thank you very much for, for being with us um, today. So we will start with a round of questions for our MEPs. And uh, as soon as we start now, please feel free to use the, the Q&A box to um, ask questions to the panelists. Um, if you do so, um, just make sure you identify yourself on Zoom with your full name, maybe your organization. And if you ask questions, um, keep them short um, and maybe indicate to whom you're asking the question. You can also share one or the other comment in, in the Q&A box, but let's try to keep it really for questions. So I can make sure we can, we can pick up um, the most popular questions. You can also like questions so we see which questions are most liked. And if you, um, um, if you use Twitter, don't hesitate to share your thoughts um, with the hashtag fiscal matters. So um, let me introduce our panelists. First, we have uh, Rasmus Andersen. He's a German member of the European Parliament uh, since 2019. Um, he's a coordinator for the Green Group in the Committee on Budget. And he was, for instance, part of the negotiations for the multi-annual financial framework for the current um, period. Um, welcome, um, Rasmus. Then we have um, Margarida Marquez. She's a Portuguese MEP. She's uh, the rapporteur on the review of the European Economic Governance Framework, and she is also a member of the Recovery and Resilience Facility Working Group. Um, thank you um, very much, uh, Margarida, um, from uh, the Social uh, Democrats. Then we have um, if he has joined us, he hasn't joined us um, so far, but we hope that we still will have um, Jose Guzmão, also Portuguese MEP, um, joining us. He's the vice chair and group coordinator of the left um, on the Committee on Economic and um, Monetary Affairs. He has just joined us, so um, welcome, um, Jose. We have uh, Ludek Niedermeyer. He's a Czech politician and economist serving as an MEP since 2014. He is the vice chair of the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs um, for the European People's Party. Welcome to you as well. And last but not least, we have Valérie Haye. She's a French MEP for Renew since 2019 and in charge of budgetary issues. So um, welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for, for joining us this um, morning. So um, before we go into your questions, just a very brief introduction. 
Um, as you all know, um, in order to ensure the stability of the economic and monetary union, the EU has put forward um, the fiscal framework to prevent issues with public finances. Um, a reform amending the stability and growth pact entered into force at the end of 2011. Um, there's also the intergovernmental treaty on stability, coordination and governance in the economic and monetary union, including the, the fiscal compact, which uh, entered into force in 2013. And so did a regulation on assessing national draft budgetary plans. Um, a key element of the growth and stability pact is the excessive deficit procedure, the EDP, which seeks to prevent excessive deficits and to ensure um, they are rectified. And um, this procedure has two famous uh, criteria or criteria that we often hear about in the news, the deficit criterion and the debt criterion. Um, the deficit criterion um, saying that a general government deficit is considered to be excessive if it is higher than the reference value of 3% of GDP at market prices. And the debt criterion, if debt is higher than 60% of GDP and the annual debt reduction target um, of 1 20th of the debt is excess of the 60% threshold um, if, um, if that has not been achieved over the last three years. So we talk a lot about these two um, criterion. Um, and we will go into a discussion about um, them and the other elements um, of the pact and the framework today. So let me start with a first question um, to uh, Ludek Niedermeyer and then maybe also Jose Guzmao wants to um, react as well. So um, what are your lessons um, from the past decade um, regarding the, the fiscal framework? What are your learnings? Um, let us start with uh, Ludek and maybe an answer or reaction from Cosmao. Thank you very much, Patricia, and thanks for, for inviting me. And I thank especially for this question, because as you said, I'm by background mostly, uh, mostly uh, economist. <clears throat> Concerning the European fiscal rules, I guess we are now working uh, on the third generation of these rules, and I was grateful to work together with uh, Margarita and the others on, uh, uh, on the view of European Parliament of these rules. And as this will be the third rules, actually, we should learn from the past. We have started a long time ago when the EMU was introduced uh, with the very simple rules that were relying very much on the responsibility of the governments economy behind the limits that you have Patricia just mentioned is really not strong. This was kind of ju just a general guidance provided to the country and uh, this really rely on responsible management of the fiscal policy. And as we know, it totally failed. Then the second generation of the rules came after the last crisis. And I must say it was economically much more sound but it lacked transparency and also it lacked something like a robustness, especially in short run, it hasn't provided the, the it provided kind of navigation for the, uh, for the policy of the, of the member states. Nevertheless, uh, if you look at the data, you can see that the rules were quite uh, successful because after uh, the EU overcome the crisis of 2009 and 10 and has got back to the growth, during the growth period, we were able on average reduce the debt to GDP around two percentage point a year. That is really not the bad, while the economy was very uh, growing very well. So the burden of the debt was, uh, was reduced and especially the debt is in the center of the question or the goal of sustainability of the fiscal policy. So what, what lessons I can, I, I can uh, uh, draw from that? So it seems to me that due to growing populism and irresponsibility in politics, not only in the EU, but uh, globally, we in the EU need uh, uh, robust, uh, well-designed rules. Frankly, we are at the same boat. If someone is digging a hole into the boat, uh, he's threatening everyone. So we need more responsibility. We need, uh, we need more, more, uh, more cooperation. Uh, I guess the rules must be economically sound, must be transparent so that even the citizens see how the governments are doing and must provide a clear guidance even in the short time. 
there must be sufficient flexibility to be able to deal with short and unpredictable cases or catastrophes as we were facing in the last two years. And at the same time, we must be sure that we go back and recover uh, this uh, uh, excessive uh, debt building in the good or uh, normal, uh, normal time. But I must say that even the best rule uh, would fail if the governments will not be responsible and cooperative. And, and to ask people to be responsible and cooperative, uh, you don't need a law. You just need a goodwill. Sometimes uh, it seems to me we are missing that in EU. So that's all for the introduction. Thanks a lot, uh, Ludek. So, uh, Jose, what is your uh, response to that? I mean, we've heard from Ludek that, um, let's say, from the economic perspective, he's arguing that, uh, that, that the framework has been you know, delivered sound uh, results, um, that there have been successes to reduce debt uh, and to ensure economic recovery. He was also arguing maybe for the new round, we need to step up transparency for citizens. Um, we need more responsibility from um, each and every uh, member state. Um, what are your learnings from the last 10 years of uh, the European fiscal framework? Uh, thank you for the invitation. I, I have to uh, uh, warn you that I have some morning family commitments, so I will be switching off my camera at some point in this debate. Um, well, I, I think we should uh, analyze the uh, uh, results of the uh, economic governance framework uh, with some hard data, uh, and um, and I can maybe use the example of Portugal, because uh, it's uh, very often said that the economic governance framework it's is the same for all countries, uh, but the process of economic integration was not the same for for all countries, and we have countries that have benefited hugely with uh, euro integration and other countries that have amassed uh, vast amounts of private and ex uh, the mostly external debt due to their commitment with the eurozone uh, and i think that an economic fiscal, fiscal governance framework has to take that into account because the uh, we must remember what is uh, uh, incorrectly known as the public debt crisis was not a public debt crisis at all. It was a financial cri crisis that um, built uh, on the basis of uh, external imbalances within the Eurozone, uh, the cause of which was never solved and is still not, not solved. Um, we can analyze the case of Portugal. And after the financial crisis, there was an, uh, um, uh, an economic recovery that was built on uh, fiscal, uh, on, on, on investment and spending by national governments, which was encouraged by the European Union, and of course, led to uh, increasing uh, deficits and uh, uh, some uh, significant increase in, uh, in public debts, although a part of this uh, increase had nothing to do with fiscal response, which was quite virtuous, but with the fact that you had automatic stabilizers like the in employment subsidies and uh, tax revenue working to get the uh, economy back on its feet. This is uh, standard counter-cyclical uh, macroeconomic policy. And what happened is that uh, in the beginning of 2010, the Commission started to demand uh, uh, fiscal adjustment to countries, and this was uh, particularly harmful to peripheral economies. From the uh, March 2010, we started to uh, have to uh, implement uh, austerity packages that in Portugal was known, were known as PACs, and then we have the Troika, Troika adjustment program. It's not very easy to uh, uh, to um, quantify this precisely because this began in, the, in March 2010. But to give you an idea, the adjustment period, what is called the adjustment period in Portugal from the beginning of 2010 till the end of the Troika adjustment program, led to a rise in the public debt ratio uh, of 35 percentage points. This was a catastrophe for, for Portugal, not only economically, not only socially, but also to our public accounts. So the, the framework was a complete 
disaster in our country because it relies, it still relies on bad macroeconomic policy, on the idea that we should cut expenditure and investment in periods of crisis, which make, make a lot of sense for a, a household, but it makes no sense for a national economy. And I think that the ideas that we have behind the revision of the economic governance framework still don't address neither this issue nor the issue of macroeconomic imbalances. And I will end by here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Jose. Um, well, that, that I think leads me to um, Margarita. Um, maybe you, you want to, to comment on what uh, the colleagues have already said, but um, um, given the, the, the change or the new macroeconomic context um, that has developed since these rules are put in place, um, what do you think is, is different now and what needs to be taken into account um, for the new framework? Um, if you want to go first, Margarita, and then I'd like to hear a reaction from, from Valérie. Okay, thank you. Uh, congratulations for uh, organizing this debate. Uh, and for me, it's a pleasure to be with Lodec because we worked very well, uh, very well and very much, very hard together uh, to prepare uh, the report. And uh, we could uh, vote the, the, the report in the plenary session. The report was adopted with uh, a large consensus. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that the, the European Parliament is now in condition to, to orient the debate uh, on the revision of the uh, European fiscal rules. And this is important for the European Parliament as an institution, but also for the revision and the content of the revision. Because when the Commission will put on the table the new proposals, uh, commission is aware which is the position of the parliament and in my point of view this is very important um, on the, 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 the new rules uh, the new rules uh, I think that we have um, I can say three pillars um, of the revision and for the revision and maybe one uh, umbrella uh, on the three pillars sustainability of public finances inclusive and sustainable growth uh, and the promotion of uh, investment. Why these three pillars? I think that we need to learn from the past what was well done and what was not well done and the consequences we had on social, on economic, and also on political point of view, uh, because this is very important. And the Guzmão spoke on the uh, Portuguese case. I think that Port Portugal is a, a case study. We need to look what happened in two different periods, 2011, 2015, and 2015, 2019, with the same rules, but we had very different political uh, 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 orientation. And this is very important. And the uh, umbrella. Um, the, the new rules must be built upon in democratic legitimacy, accountability, and scrutiny if uh, in, in a governance uh, framework. Uh, it means it's clear that uh, there were not in the past uh, enough ownership from the member states side and also the new rules must be more democratic, more simple. I fully agree with Ludek, but also I need to add that they must be more simple because citizens, not only citizens, politicians must understand the rules because nowadays, I'm sorry, they can't understand because the complexity is so big that we can't understand the rules. They must be more simple and more democratic with more uh, democratic uh, 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 scrutiny. This is very important. Then there are another point that I'd like to, to react uh, what uh, uh, Guzmão uh, said. Uh, I, I fully agree with his uh, uh, analysis. I don't agree with him on the analysis he did uh, on the report adopted by the Parliament. Uh, because clearly uh, the report is on the way to promote investment 
to be coherent with European uh, political priorities. It means we can't say that we must do the digital transition and fight uh, 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 for, for climate, and we don't give to member states enough capacity to invest uh, on these uh, two points or on social issues. It means we must have uh, investment uh, to promote economic growth and to be coherent with, um, uh, with the, the political priorities. But to, to, to finalize, uh, I think that, to, uh, I'd like to say that, uh, and I think that here we have a clear idea. We need to move from a stability and growth pact to a sustainable and growth pact. I think that the point is to move for stability to sustainable. This does not mean that I'm against stability, but until now, only stability was a key point and we need to have sustainability as a key point. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Margarita. Um, Valerie, um, different opinions have been put on the table. Um, what's your take on, on the reform and your learnings from the last 10 years? Thank you. I was speaking French. Um, <coughs> merci pour l'invitation. Um, uh, je pense qu'effectivement, beaucoup... Uh, euh, les, les, les collègues qui m'ont précédé ont souligné euh, le manque d'investissement et ça c'est une réalité et donc je crois qu'on s'accorde tous ou beaucoup d'entre nous s'accordent sur le fait qu'il faut euh, qu'on qu examine la situation, qu'on tire les enseignements de la période passée qu'on tire aussi et qu'on tienne compte de ce qui a changé aujourd'hui pour se projeter euh, dans l'avenir avec, ses, euh, avec euh, euh, je, je l'espère de nouvelles règles en la matière euh, parce que oui le contexte n'est plus le même qu'avant. Et euh, ça, c'est une, une réalité. La, la pandémie euh, elle a engendré, euh, engendré une crise économique qui a touché tous les États sans distinction. Euh, et ça, je crois que c'est nouveau parce que dans les précédentes crises euh, qu'a connues la zone euro euh, ou l'Union européenne en général, les chocs, ils étaient asymétriques. Euh, et euh, à l'époque, le manque de solidarité, de solidarité n'avait pas permis euh, d'atténuer ces chocs. Et avec la crise qu'on a connue l'année dernière et qu'on connaît encore, il y a eu un, un, un élan de solidarité. Euh, solidarité humaine, solidarité matérielle, solidarité financière. Et, euh, et je crois vraiment que cette solidarité euh, retrouvée, on doit absolument la, la préserver et la cultiver. Premier point de différence, je crois, fondamental par rapport à, aux pré précédentes crises. Il y a aussi un, un élément euh, qui est différent et dont on doit tenir compte, c'est le niveau d'endettement des États. Euh, pour certains, il a atteint des niveaux très élevés. La Grèce est à 200% de son PIB, l'Italie est à 150%, la France est à 120% et la moyenne dans la zone euro est de 100%. Et ça, je crois que c'est aussi une donnée à prendre en compte, à savoir que le retour à la normale, entre guillemets, ne va pas se faire rapidement. Et à cet égard, je crois qu'on doit développer une stratégie de désendettement, bien sûr, mais cette stratégie de désendettement ne doit pas se faire au détriment du retour à la croissance. Et c'est cet équilibre qu'il faudra trouver. Je pense qu'il faut avoir, en parallèle de la stratégie de désendettement, une stratégie de croissance continue pour éviter de tomber dans le trou d'investissement qu'on a connu sur la précédente décennie et qui pourrait finalement porter atteinte à la relance qu'on a bâtie collectivement. Euh, et, et je crois aussi que dans la mesure où les économies européennes sont interconnectées, euh, il pourrait être intéressant de penser ces stratégies collectivement, à la, à la fois stratégie de désendettement et stratégie euh, de croissance continue collectivement euh, euh, au sein de l'Eurogroupe notamment. Euh, un, une nouvelle, un, un point de différence aussi euh, qui est important de noter, je pense, par rapport à la précédente, déc à la précédente décennie et qui va, euh, je crois, euh, avoir des implications euh, durablement, je l'espère, c'est que l'Union européenne est entrée sur les marchés avec une forte demande pour, pour les bons de la relance européenne. Donc, je crois qu'on doit avoir à l'esprit l'arrivée de ce nouvel acteur sur le marché, cet acteur majeur sur le marché, et à mon avis, ça aura des incidences pour la suite. Et puis, dernier point de, de changement qui permet d'identifier ou de marquer le nouveau contexte macroéconomique, c'est cette dette européenne qu'il va falloir gérer. Euh, et vous le savez, le Parlement européen 
se mobilise depuis des années pour la création de nouvelles ressources propres. Et, euh, et, et je crois que euh, depuis l'année dernière, on a évidemment un argument supplémentaire pour avancer sur cette question des ressources propres parce que les ressources propres doivent permettre de rembourser euh, la relance. Et on voit que de manière générale, euh, euh, les États, de, de la même manière que les ressources propres, elles ont vocation à créer de la justice euh, fiscale également. On voit aussi que de manière générale, les États regardent encore plus pour euh, voir comment on peut faire contribuer ceux qui ne paient pas leur juste part d'impôt aujourd'hui. Euh, et je crois que l'accord euh, à l'OCDE euh, en la matière n'est pas étranger à ce contexte. Euh, donc, c'est euh, le signe qu'on se dirige vers plus de justice fiscale, euh, notamment euh, pour faire payer les, les grandes multinationales et les grands pollueurs. Ce sont, je crois, des changements de fond euh, qui reflètent un nouveau contexte macroéconomique et, et qu'il faut prendre en compte dans nos prochaines discussions pour faire évoluer ce cadre. Thanks a lot, Valérie. Um, Rasmus, let's hear from uh, the Green Group's uh, take on, on this. Um, from your point of view for the, the reformed EU um, fiscal framework, um, what place do you see for environmental and social objectives in that framework? How is the new framework supposed to help us achieve the environmental and social um, objectives? including also um, gender equality, other um, equality challenges that we have. Thanks, um, uh, Patricia, for giving me the floor and for the invitation and organizing this event. Let me start out by saying that my feeling is that the economic framework of the European Union had never worked. And now we even have some more challenges ahead where we need to see some changes to the framework because we are afraid of that if we are not changing it, we will um, not reach our goals related to yeah, social development, um, employment, but especially also on the climate crisis, uh, climate crisis and the biodiversity uh, crisis we are facing. So um, we need to, to, to change the economic framework to address those uh, challenges. And uh, I mean, the best um, argument for what I said is actually that um, we could see it through Corona that one of the first things the European Commission and the member states did was to suspend the current framework. So um, if you need to suspend a framework in a crisis, in a big an economic framework, in an economic crisis, then everything is, or not everything, but something is wrong uh, on, uh, on the way how, how things are working. And this is why it's really urgent to, to address uh, those challenges. And my hope is at least that also with the, with the new German government, we will also have an honest debate, especially in my country, about economic questions <clears throat> like this, because this is much needed for the European Union. Um, I think we need uh, to to have a much different approach and let's let's phrase it like a new economic thinking on what our economic goals should uh, be. It's not just about debt, it's about different crises we need to address and crises where we need to find solutions also on uh, when it comes to fiscal policy and this is why I think that we need to have like social and ecological goals in the center of the new framework. We need to have a closer look on the economic division. We need to have a closer look on the role also the public, public spending, um, for example, uh, plays. Um, also things like a, a good um, functional uh, welfare system where we can see a development, a positive development in all countries and not just in the richer countries of the European Union with good health care, for example, especially now uh, after we, we got through a big, um, a big uh, the Corona crisis. Um, and I also think that we need to have, like also some of the colleagues already mentioned, we need to address it in a transparent way. We need also to discuss not just the goals that, um, for, for the for national debt, but we also have need to have a look on the recommendations, for example, the uh, European Union is coming with uh, for the member states, our group, maybe also in, um, in difference to, for example, the left uh, wants 
to have an economic framework. So we think we should address those issues at the European level. We would like to be a European federalist. So we would like to see, see it addressed, but we need to do it much different than um, the way we did in the last years. Thanks, uh, Rasmus. I, I'll directly um, put a question to you from, from the audience because you, you touched upon the, the fact that there's a new uh, German government, um, likely with uh, the Green Party um, as being part of the coalition. Um, so the question is um, from um, Michael, what is the likelihood of a new German government um, supporting a reform of European fiscal rules to allow for greater levels of deficit funded investment spending? How much of a priority is that for the dream German Green Party? For us, um, Greens, it's a big priority to come up with a different fiscal policy in Germany on national level, but also in the European context. You all know how the election uh, elections went on Sunday, so we are in a quite complicated situation there, to be honest. Um, most likely the first thing which will happen is to have, a, have coalition talks with the Liberals and um, the Social Democrats. The Social Democrats are on many of those issues close to the Greens, but their candidate, the finance minister Olaf Scholz, he said in an interview two weeks ago that the fiscal policy, uh, the fiscal rules at European level are working well and that he don't think, uh, he doesn't think it needs to be reformed. So there is also a challenge, especially uh, with him. And as you may know, the German liberals have a quite different position than the French liberals, for example, on those issues. So it will really be a big conflict, especially with, with the German liberals there. And at the end, we need to find a way um, to, to, to address those challenges. And maybe there are some solutions also coming up from, from uh, think tanks, for example, um, how you could stick to a framework, but maybe find a better way to handle it, uh, come with different criteria uh, on some of those elements. But to be, a bit, but it's for sure that that the fiscal policy will be one of the key conflicts in the coalition talks we will have in the next weeks. Thanks, uh, Rasmus. Um, let me come back to, to Ludek and, and Valerie. We started talking about, uh, let's say, the interlinkages between um, the EU fiscal framework and, um, well, not just the social objectives, but also our environmental objectives. Um, Ludek, um, how do you see um, climate-related fiscal um, risks? I mean, how should we address or how do we have to address the huge fiscal risk uh, due to runaway climate change? Thank you for, for, for the question. And let me say, and here I, I guess uh, would easily find uh, agreement with Rasmus Magrida and and uh, Variedi and the others. I guess the climate is the key goal, and we cannot fail on this. You know, I have kids, and I want to make sure that they will have good life on the uh, on the planet. And uh, I guess we must do more than we do. But uh, at the beginning, we must be very good in setting the targets, setting the, the goals, and setting the way how to uh, how to reach them. Uh, and obviously, whenever necessary, we must provide incentives for firms and the businesses. Uh, I believe that uh, on the way to climate transition, there will be a lot of investments uh, going on. And these investments will support the economic activity, create uh, create uh, the, the jobs, uh, generate uh, the growth, increase the revenues. And they will be able to offset uh, partly or fully the gradual decline of uh, other, uh, other industries. And I'm really not sure if to anticipate that there will be really huge, uh, huge consequences for the fiscal policy. I'm not sure if it's really fully justified. Just take into the account, for, for example, electricity generation. We all know that the investments into renewables, uh, that means solar and wind, are the most efficient, are the least costly way how to generate the electricity. So why it should be more expensive to actually build renewable um, electricity sources than to, to, to reinvest into bad, uh, dirty fossil fuel economy. So, you know, uh, I guess uh, it could be argued that uh, 
that uh, it's not clear how serious the fiscal consequences should be. I guess our priority, first of all, should be that the governments must use its uh, financial resources a responsible way. If climate is the priority, then more of money that are collected by the governments from people and from businesses must be directed to the climate. That means that obviously there will be less money to spend for something that is lower, low priority. I guess that's the rule number one. The second, obviously, we can make a transition more efficient by selecting the right mix of the tools for decarbonization, starting with the, with the most efficient, providing the subsidies, but definitely not higher subsidies than it's necessary to get the result that we want to reach. And then, then last, not least, uh, we must respect the situation of low income, uh, income people, because some of them then do, don't have financial, financial tools to find a more efficient solution. And here, obviously, the social policy must play, uh, play the role. But you know, I'm not sure uh, really how big the fiscal impact uh, will be. And I guess what's important is that fiscal rules exist for the reason to really frame overall fiscal uh, uh, financial policy of the government. And I don't think that it will bring anything good if we say that there are fiscal rules that apply for certain far for the budget, but there are some other priorities that are outside. You know, we should have in mind that climate, this is not an issue for next year or year after or next five years. We will be investing or supporting this climate transition for next 20, 30 years. And if we would say that certain part of the fiscal policy will be excluded from the rules, then obviously we will see huge slippage. And very soon we will have to compensate, uh, change the rules in order to incorporate this, this change. So I guess we must do things rightly. I believe that because there is not at all just the costs, but there are also benefits of this. I'm really not sure how serious uh, uh, the impact or, uh, on the fiscal policy will be. But if there is, I am really open to, to reconsider my position. And here I must say that I share view of Rasmus. If we need uh, some extra money to support climate, climate transition, my personal view is that it would be smarter to do it through the European budget and not to do it through slippage in the in the budgets of uh, of the of the member states. But uh, th that's my opinion. Um, thanks. Let me just uh, uh, read out one comment. Um... Uh, from from the, the 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 audience to you, um, so there's uh, Renat who's saying that uh, does the EPP realize that the needed investments to meet the climate objectives can never be realized with the actual rules, for instance, that the balanced budget criterion with no exception for investment, and that we need more leeway for green investments, um, and um, for instance. Uh, how to deviate resources to green investments. Um, so um, well, not, not sure how to understand the question, um, Renat, but well, I guess that the, the main comment is um, that the current framework um, does not allow enough flexibility for, for green investments. Do, do you have a, a comment on that? Sure, uh, I guess it's good to read uh, what is on the table because Magrida made an enormous uh, work to uh, come with a good proposal and I was very happy that we were able to find the, the uh, consensus on that and you know maybe some of my colleagues in EPP were not terribly happy about it but I must say that I'm very proud of the report that we put together so this is not about balanced uh, this is not about balanced budget it. This is about the expenditure ceiling. So this is, uh, this is uh, really different. And uh, as we know, there is ongoing debate if certain resources could be excluded. But I'm just warning that if this will be huge amounts of, of expenditures, then basically we have no rule because the rule that is acceptable for half of the money and is, uh, is exempted for the second half of money is no rule, uh, no rule at all. And also, again, I am arguing that I, am, I believe that most of the work should be done, first of all, by smart setting up the, the measures that we take and efficient use of the resources within the budget. It's like at home. If you have some priority, for example, to invest into, into future of your kids through education and you have limited resources and everyone on the planet has limited resources, then you have to reflect it in the other, other spending. So I guess, first of all, we must, we must be efficient in deciding how to allocate money that, 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 that we have. And as I said, if at the end of the day, 
we see that it doesn't work. Uh, I would rather turn to, to the, the uh, European budget, and this is actually, this was one of the ideas of the fiscal rule to say that, for example, the projects that are financed through the European budget and are co-financed at home can be can be exempted. This is something that I can I can I can imagine. And also I must say that I'm not sure if Renata has better a clearer view what will be the net cost. Because obviously there will be huge investments. Some investments will need uh, certain incentives from the budget, but there will be also the, the revenues because we will speed up investment substantially. If we are smart, we are supporting the, the economy that is creating more jobs. Uh, more jobs are creating more taxes, and that means improving the revenues of the government and reducing the expenditures. So, so I would not be here so skeptical. We should do our job as well, as best as we can. And if we see it's not enough, we should go back to the table and try to find the good way. But the last thing I want to say, to crash with the fiscal sustainability, and I agree with Magrida, sustainability is, is the goal. Get to the situation of very high, a very high debt to the GDP. Get to the situation where markets are not willing to finance, uh, finance the deficit at reasonable cost. This will not bring anything good to people. And obviously, this is, uh, this is the thing that would kill also the, the decarbonization because of lack of resources. So I guess the sustainability of fiscal, uh, fiscal policy is precondition of everything, including the highest priorities that, that we very reasonably and responsibly want to have. Thank you, uh, Ludek. Um, let me turn to Valerie. Um, so what is your kind of take on um, how the new EU fiscal framework can allow or better allow um, or boost investment in, in the right uh, in the right sector, the investments in um, well, in, in, the, in the areas that uh, help us to achieve our environmental objectives. But then there was also a question about um, climate rated fiscal risks. And I think when we when we think about risks, we also think about risks related to what we have experienced um, this year um, with kind of huge damage created through um, climate change induced um, natural hazards, whether it was the wildfires in Greece or the floods in Germany and Belgium or the tornadoes in Italy, etc. So these are climate rated financial and fiscal risks that we will have to face um, in the future. Um, what, what do you think? Alors, effectivement, je crois qu'il faut investir, 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 et cette sens des négociations budgétaires aussi qui ont été menées euh, euh, l'année l'année dernière euh, avec cette euh, ce, ce, ce minimum de 37% des dépenses. Euh, du plan de relance dédié au climat, euh, le, les 30, euh, 37% du plan de relance, pardonnez-moi, dédié au climat, 30% euh, du budget européen euh, dédié au climat, 10% dédié, dédié à, la, à la biodiversité. Donc, c'est la traduction du fait que, oui, nous, Européens, nous sommes conscients qu'il faut avancer et, euh, et, euh, et avancer à marche forcée et collectivement pour euh, engager la transition, euh, la transition environnementale et la financer. Je crois que, euh, il y a deux types de risques budgétaires liés au climat, de, deux types de nature différentes. D'abord, qu'on n'en fasse pas assez, euh, c'est-à-dire qu'on qu n'investisse pas assez, qu'on qu ne mette pas assez d'argent sur la table, et dans ce cas, euh, on ne parvient pas à, on parvienne pas à contrer le plus grand des problèmes auxquels nous faisons face, euh, à savoir la lutte contre le changement, le changement climatique. Et dans ce cas-là, ça veut dire qu'on ne parviendrait pas sur le court, le moyen et le long terme à atténuer... Euh, les feux de forêt euh, qu'on a vus euh, euh, en Grèce, par exemple, les inondations, euh, et, dans ce, et, et auquel cas, on continuerait à dépenser des milliards euh, à la suite des catastrophes environnementales. Premier risque. Deuxième risque, d'une nature différente, mais qu'il faut vraiment avoir en tête et qui a déjà été souligné, euh, qu'on fasse trop poser, peser la charge sur les contribuables euh, euh, et sur les particuliers. Or, euh, pourquoi c'est un risque Parce que l'assentiment euh, de tous, de l'ensemble de la population, euh, il est clé pour une transition écologique réussie. Si les citoyens voient leur facture de chauffage, d'électricité, de carburant euh, augmenter, doubler, tripler, que sais-je, euh, tout en par ailleurs remarquant que les grandes multinationales mettent en place des montages, des montages fiscaux pour échapper à, à l'impôt, que euh, les géants du numérique restent les grands exemptés du XXIe siècle ou que les grosses industries chinoises qui polluent n'ont aucune contrainte euh, ou incitation à diminuer leur empreinte carbone, alors la transition se transformera euh, en échec. Donc les citoyens ont un risque que les citoyens descendent dans la rue, donc il faut vraiment qu'on engage l'ensemble 
des citoyens européens, et évidemment l'Europe a vocation à être, je crois qu'elle est leader en la matière, euh, il faut que ce soit une démarche collective avec une adhésion de la part euh, de l'ensemble des acteurs. Euh, et dans ce contexte, il y a évidemment une solution idéale qui s'impose, euh, en faire plus, euh, investir plus, euh, grâce à des contributions plus justes. Euh, et évidemment, on sait qu'au niveau national, euh, c'est plus difficile de faire contribuer les géants et la bonne échelle, de la même manière que pour engager la transition environnementale, l'échelle continentale européenne euh, est la bonne échelle, et bien sur la contribution, des, 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 le fait de faire contribuer les géants, et notamment la politique fiscale, euh, et bien, euh, à de nombreux égards, l'échelle continentale, supranationale est bien plus efficace. Donc C'est pour ça, ça qu'on doit changer d'échelle et ne plus envisager la création de recettes uniquement euh, au niveau national. Euh, je crois que l'Union européenne, elle est euh, un excellent niveau pour instaurer euh, une taxe sur les transactions financières qui serait robuste, pour euh, mettre en place un mécanisme d'ajustement carbone qui serait euh, utile et conséquent, euh, et, et d'un marché carbone comme il existe euh, aujourd'hui. Et euh, évidemment, ces recettes découlant des politiques européennes, euh, elles doivent venir abonder le budget européen. Euh, ce sont donc euh, les, les ressources propres euh, qu'on a négocié en fin d'année dernière et acté dans un calendrier juridiquement contraignant. Et ces ressources propres, elles doivent permettre de rembourser le plan de relance européen. Et je le redis, qui, qui vise ou qui, qui, qui a aussi pour objectif de, de, de financer 37% de ce plan de relance dédié, dédié aux actions climatiques. Donc, ce sont des solutions très concrètes qu'on met sur la table et qu'il va falloir déployer, continuer de déployer dans les prochains mois. Et le Parlement européen serait évidemment très actif. Thanks a lot, Valérie. Um, we have one very popular question um, from uh, Carolyn uh, White um, from the um, Foundation um, for the Economics of Sustainability. Um, she refers to um, um, Margarita's comment about um, changing the growth and stability pact to growth and sustainability, uh, sorry, from the, the growth and stability into growth and sustainability pact. So she's saying, um, that she believes it would be more realistic and sensible um, to replace growth with prosperity and well-being um, as the goal, so basically a well-being and sustainability pact, in line with the growth agnostic stance that is advocated by ecological economists and um, also strongly backed up by empirical evidence. Um, indeed, we have uh, recently published a report that shows that in the EU there's no, or nowhere in the world basically, there's empirical evidence that um, economic, uh, infinite economic growth can be fully and sufficiently decoupled from, um, from environmental impact. And even the European Economic, uh, sorry, the e European Environmental Agency has now taken, uh, let's say, post-growth um, approach, arguing then uh, that as long as uh, our overall policy framework is kind of focused on um, infinite economic growth as the objective, we will not be able to reach our economic and social objective. So. Um, Margarita, can you comment on the question of whether we need actually a um, well-being and sustainability pact, um, and how do you relate to the question of um, the um, objective of infinite GDP growth um, as part of the EU fiscal framework? And maybe also uh, Jose Guzmao wants to comment on that question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Caroline, for your question. But uh, if uh, Patricia give me the opportunity, I'd like to react to a point on uh, uh, what Udek said. Uh, it means uh, I fully agree that, first of all, we have the next generation EU is the European money to recover, to, to recover the economy. And this is very important. This is very innovative in the European Union framework. And of course, as Valérie said, and we had it during the negotiations, uh, the MFF negotiations, we need new uh, own results to finance not only the next generation EU, at least now the next generation EU, but I wish in the future to have a different a contribution for the European Union budget. Uh, and uh, Next Generation EU and SURE uh, must uh, be seen 
as innovative tools uh, that uh, we can't lose them in the future and we can we must use them in the future so this is a key uh, one point the second point yes uh, we have european money and national money for the climate for the social, for the digital uh, uh, transition. But the point is nowadays, the, we have the general scape clause activated. So member states um, don't need to look to debt and uh, deficit uh, now to respect the Maastricht criteria. But the general scape clause is activated until the end of the next year. And next generation EU must be used, must be committed until the end of 2023 and to be spent until the end of 2026. So the first point is, I agree that we must have together European money and national money. But the point is, we must have fiscal rules that give conditions to member states to use the money. Because I know very well in the past in my country, in Greece, for example, I, I know a very concrete example, uh, when the mayor of Athens had a lot of money for a social project, and he or she couldn't use the money because Greece must respect the deficit criteria. So, and they couldn't use the European money. So my point is we need, okay, we need to have together European money and national money, but we need to have uh, um, rules, um, a, a, a framework, uh, strong enough uh, uh, to, to be used and to give conditions to member states to use the money. And my point is we don't, flexibility is not enough. I know that Scholz and Hasmus remember this, Scholz, Olaf Scholz said before elections that we don't need to change the rules because we can use all the flexibility. And my reaction is now, yes, we need to use all the flexibility, but in the future, flexibility is not enough and we need to clarify and to have a new, clearly a new fiscal rules uh, framework to improve, to increase investment and uh, economic growth. To react directly to uh, Caroline. Yes, I fully agree uh, with her. It means we have a key challenge nowadays the economic recovery. But it's clear that we need to have a new economic framework. And I fully agree with you. We must have as key elements in our approach, like uh, well-being, like uh, social uh, aspects, because we know very well that the, uh, uh, the, the, the climate transition has a huge impact in social uh, issues, because we know very well that are some areas, some regions in some countries where when we act on climate, there are a strong impact on unemployment, on social issues, and uh, we need to integrate all these elements in our new economic approach. Thank you, Caroline, for your uh, question. I see, Usman, you also want to come in on, on this debate. Yes, uh, I, I think uh, I think I agree with uh, Car Caroline's um, uh, ideas. I would just like, uh, in in the sense that I I think we should um, um, defocus uh, from growth um, as uh, the all encompassing indicator that tells us if we're doing good or bad. Uh, we we, sh we should be more attentive to economic, social, and environmental indicators that tell us a lot more about how we're living than uh, growth, which is a very, it's an accounting indicator. It, 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 it has value, it can be uh, used, 
but it can also be a misguided way of conducting economic policy. For instance, if tomorrow all European uh, member states would uh, shift from uh, the automobile into collective transportation, that would probably lead to a decrease in GDP, which doesn't mean that we would be living uh, worse. Uh, it actually would mean exactly the opposite. We, we would be living better. It would be better for the environment, but not for economic growth. Well, the only um, uh, aspect that I would like to mention is that we shouldn't uh, mistake uh, what Caroline called uh, post-growth uh, policy with degrowth theories, which I think are just as misguided as uh, economic growth based uh, theories, because they're basically the same theory standing on its head. The idea that if we have degrowth, then we will do be doing well. And, uh, and I think um, uh, that's also not a, bit, a very good way to go. Um, so I, I think Indicators are uh, 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 employment, uh, social indicators, um, uh, emi uh, CO2 emissions. I mean, we should uh, evaluate in a more complex way the kind of policies that we are implementing. Uh, and I would like to, uh, uh, I think the, 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 the problem with the re review of the economic governance framework is that uh, 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 there's a lot of talk about uh, transparency but to me, transparency is to have uh, clear rules for all member states and not discretionary powers, even more uh, uh, discretionary powers being given to the commission to decide whether member states should have the flexibility or not. Because it's not true that this crisis had a, a symmetrical impact on, on member states because some member states were able to react very quickly and very strongly to the crisis. We can look at the example of Germany that which in the first year spent more than the entire uh, um, uh, grants part of the RRF and other countries were not able to do uh, 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 the, the same thing. Uh, and this is true also for state aid for exactly the same reasons. So what we need to have from 2023 is a different set of economic governance rules. And I think, um, well, on the one hand, I think that we have a recommendation from the European Fiscal Board on the golden rule for investments that has to be implemented so that uh, we don't get an increasing lag between uh, core and peripheral economies within the Eurozone. I can tell you, for instance, that net public investment in Portugal has been negative for the past 10 years. This means that our country is literally going back when it comes to public infrastructure. This is a situation that is unsustainable, even from a, a, only a perspective of Eurozone integrity. This cannot go on indefinitely. Uh, the second issue, and, and I mean, this is maybe uh, a bit going a bit outside the debate, is that we're still working on um, a scarcity paradigm uh, uh, for the debate on economic governance, which is ideologically self-imposed. For instance, uh, the US and the UK are using vast amounts of monetary financing to get over this crisis. And we have a self-imposed restriction that doesn't allow us to do the same thing, uh, that the Fed is doing, the Bank of England is doing it. And we could uh, very easily put that in place with public debt cancellation held by the ECB or monetary financing for uh, public deficits to respond to this crisis. And I think the debate on economic governance should also address this uh, um, uh, arbitrary restriction that still exists in the ECB uh, statute and, and in the treaties. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Jose, for that. Um, actually, Ludek and uh, Valerie have to leave, or Valerie already had to leave for another engagement. So um, thank you already to, the, to, the, to both of you for, for participating. Um, I would like to um, direct one last question um, at Rasmus. Um, before we then hand over for a kind of uh, summary and uh, and uh, final deck, um, 
for a final um, statement from um, Wendel from uh, Climate Action Network. So Rasmus, there's a, a popular question um, in, uh, in the chat box um, from Andras Lukas. Um, he's saying, if I understand correctly, you said that suspending the fiscal rules during the pandemic was a good decision. Um, and now he has a question about basically how do we define green investments? How do we change the EU fiscal rules um, to make sure that there are no fossil fuel subsidies, that there is no greenwashing? So he's saying that, um, can you substantiate your opinion taking into account that the governments have used the easing of fiscal rules to support, first of all, fossil fuel industries and environmentally harmful activities, and at the same time, they did almost nothing or very little, depending on the country, I guess, to remove environmentally harmful subsidies um, and to internalize the external costs, implement serious measures to reduce corruption, tax wealth, etc. Yes, thanks for the question. And from my perspective, there are two steps we need to take. First of all, we need to create fiscal space in an economic crisis with a big division, with a lot of crises and with a big spending need both at European level and on national level. I just want to be very precise there because our EPP colleague, um, uh, I'm not sure he, he misunderstood me, but, but I just want to be very clear that I think we need both, right? Um, but then if you have created the fiscal space, for example, by suspending the rules or by creating better rules, then of course you need to ensure that the money is spent for the right projects and not for harmful projects. And there, I think, for example, that the idea of having like a green rule instead of a golden rule, which means that green investments, green spending is allowed, would be, for example, an answer to the question. We need to implement the do no significant harm principle also related to the macroeconomic framework, not just for the European budget, but also for the national budgets. And I think the European Commission should be much tougher by uh, uh, controlling this. I mean, we have the debate about the recovery funds. I don't need to tell all of you about it because you're following this very closely. And you also know that my group especially is, is criticizing both the European Commission for not acting um, uh, as much as they should and the national level for coming up with climate uh, harmful projects for the climate and uh, related also to the biodiversity crisis we are facing. So for me, this is not, not uh, um, um, difference. We need to do both things um, to address those challenges. Um, because we elsewhere wouldn't wouldn't deal with that for the next years. Um, so so um, I'm very thankful for the question um, because it, indeed it's also about the quality of the spending afterwards. Thanks a lot, Rasmus. So um, let me give the floor to um, Wendel Trio. He's the director of Climate Action Network Europe. Um, so he's leading Europe's largest network of climate uh, NGOs. Wendel, what is your takeaway from today's discussion? Thank you, Patricia, and thank you um, to all the MEPs for the very interesting uh, contributions. I think, um, well, I've been asked to do a, a closing, some closing words, but I think that would not be very appropriate, as I think that the uh, the discussion is actually still only only starting. I, I noticed a number of um, interesting elements in the debate. First of all. Um, there's an, an agreement that the rules need to change, and I think that there's also an agreement that the rules need to take into account sustainability much more strongly than what they have done in the past, and I think that's uh, already an important um, recognition. I think there is clearly different views about um, how much the rules should incentivize investments, and I think this is an important part of the further debate. Similarly, I think there's a debate about the role and the autonomy for member states, the role for the European Parliament and the, the role the European Commission plays. And I think also there, there's an important element of the debate that um, we, need to, uh, we need to look further into. Um, and I heard um, an important element of the debate going around exemptions and the concept of having exemptions and what they should be. Now, I think from the perspective of our organization and probably many others, we're actually not speaking about exemptions. We're speaking about changes to the rules um, and fundamental changes to the rules that actually ensure that um, the fiscal uh, policy framework 
it remains what it should be, which is actually a tool to support some of the societal challenges that we're facing. It is not an end in itself, but it is actually meant to ensure that we can support um, uh, human development, that we can support environmental protection, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that is a very important element for us um, of, this, uh, of this debate. And in that sense, again, from a climate perspective, um, we all know that uh, the transition away from fossil fuels towards cleaner alternatives in the end will be beneficial on many different fields. It will be beneficial because it makes economic sense and many of the alternatives are much cheaper than what we have now, but it actually will be beneficial mostly because of the avoided costs of the impacts of climate change that, that we will be facing if we are not able to really reduce um, temperature rise to the uh, 1.5 degrees uh, temperature um, goal of the uh, of the Paris Agreement. So we know that in the long, long term, there's there's only benefits coming. But some of these benefits really have a long term perspective, and we know that for investments, that long term perspective um, needs often um, the necessary support, both in terms of regulatory frameworks, but also in terms of public intervention. So we believe that um, that looking at these investments as something that is really needed and crucial will be an important element of this debate. And in that sense, um, and, and Rasmus uh, uh, mentioned it at the end, one of the things that we're really looking at, not as an exemption, but as part of the rules, is what we would call the green golden investment rule. Really um, uh, integrate, fully integrating into whatever fiscal framework we will be having, the need for giving sufficient attention to um, provide a capacity for investments in the transition. And we know that investment in a transition has some challenges because there is, of course, an important uh, debate around status quo and defending of um, interests of certain companies and others that, that will benefit status quo. So we really need um, intense support at the European level and at mem member state level of these investments in the transition. Thank you. Thanks uh, a lot, Wendell. So um, we've come to the end of uh, today's, today's debate with uh, MEPs and uh, from five different political groups. So um, thank you again to all the members of parliament for joining us this morning and for uh, engaging in this debate. Thank you also to the audience. Um, thank you for your uh, great questions. Um, we haven't been able to take all of them, but I hope you, you found the debate um, interesting and, and helpful. Um, if you are um, still available, we're happy if you uh, want to join more of our meetings, um, which are still coming up uh, as part of the, the week of debate. Uh, don't forget to share your impressions or thoughts um, through Twitter and social media using hashtag fiscal matters. And also don't hesitate to reach out to um, the colleagues um, at the EB, uh, Katja Wiese and uh, at uh, Climate Action Network, Isabel, if you have any comments or feedback um, or ideas for collaboration on this topic in the future, we're happy to, to hear back from you. And we're looking forward to be working together with, well, with our colleagues in civil society and of course with, with the members of parliament on this reform. Um, so thank you very much for, for engaging in the discussion um, today. And uh, well, we hope to be in touch with you very soon. So have a very nice day and see you soon. Bye bye.